Oh, welcome to Sister to Sister. It is going to be great. Yes. Listen to this question. My husband is expecting too much from me. What should I do? Wow, how about this? Should relationships be 50-50? Should I take his last name when I get married? Oh, I did. Did you? You? Yeah, I kind of mixed it up a little oh bit. Oh my gosh! Wait and see what all the sisters say. <laughs>and welcome to Sister to Sister. We are so glad that you're watching today. We are five women of God and you're gonna hear our opinions right from our heart and mostly from the Word of God. And you sent these questions to us, so here we go. They're good, they're really good. Someone wrote to me, well not to me, but to us. My husband is expecting too much from me and I don't know how to tell him I just can't do it anymore. So I'm not sure what the husband's expecting, Corey. Well, first of all, let me give you a little saying you can say, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Practice with me. Ooh, <laughs> that's like that's saying hard. No. no, okay. That's like N-O. Uh, okay, I recently saw something else. Let me give another perspective. It said, I'm so tired of worrying about everything for everyone every second of the day. But I'm also worried that nobody will worry as good as I do about all of the things that need worrying <laughs> oh, that's about. So, good. so is he expecting too much from you? Or are you just not willing to give up some of those things because he can't do it as good as you can? I think that, you know, we need to, uh, you know, take a look at that. But, um, you know, remember he can't read your mind. Right. You need to speak up. Um, uh, you know, I had this situation in my home and I do not blame my husband whatsoever because it was me thinking I had to do everything, I could do it better, and when I spoke up, he stepped in. So I do think we need to speak up. When we're feeling overwhelmed, let's talk about it. I'm not saying every husband is going to just step in and be like, yeah, I'll do it, but let's communicate. I like that. What do you have, Aim? Well, that is like my life. He <laughs> expects a lot out of me. I expect a lot out of him. There we expect a lot out of our kids. We expect a lot out of our, I mean, it, there really are a lot of, of great expectations. And I don't think it's a bad thing when somebody has great expectations That's of you. Good. They they see something, they believe something, they need help with something big. So I, I think you have to know your pace and your grace. Yeah, so that's what I've learned so is that nice. there is a grace for us to do certain things. And when there's not a grace, you're doing it in your own works, your, and it's, it's draining, it's exhausting. There's also a pace, and my husband's pace is full bore all the time. <laughs> all the people, all the time. My pace is different. I have to have alone time, I have to have quiet time, or I cannot function like that. Do it, do so. it. Anybody else, do you ex does your husband expect? I like that he expects things. That's Amy does too. I mean, not the clothes, the dishes, the, <laughs> the food. No, all right, he can have that. Um, but I like the fact that it's encouraging to me. Look, I could be a career woman. I could be a mom. I, I could be a daughter. So when those great good expectations are on us, it inspires us to want to do those things. But when they get to be such a burden that we can't arrange our lives so that we have peace in the home, then we have to take account. And you know, I'm a lawyer. You look at the facts. The facts cannot lie. What are you doing in the day? How many hours do you have in the day? What are you called to do in the day? And if you present it like that, if you're weary, present the facts to him or her, whoever's expecting too much, and say, okay, where am I gonna fit this in? You show me, ask the question. Right. right. You show me where I'm gonna fit that in. Well, this next question is pretty similar, and it's should relationships be 50-50? I would normally say 
they should be 100 and 100. Like, come 100% of you, 100%, because 50 to me seems divided. But yeah. practically, mathematically, 50 50 <laughs> equals 100%, right? So I heard this lady, Brene Brown, talking about this factor of she said, I'm taking care of my mom, I have a ton of work. The dishes aren't done. I walk into the house and she says, listen, I've got about 20 today. And he says, you know what? I've got your back. I've got about 40 today. So it's, it's, it's like when one is hurting yes, or down, the right. other yeah, one lifts good. up. But yeah. if we're both at 10, then we need to have some big discussions of, of you know, what do we need to do? Maybe we should not talk because we're going to be very angry or mean <laughs> or rude right. or blow the marriage up. So <laughs> it's like it's kind of identifying where are you at today? Not that every day you want to just be all feely, you know, but there it is practical that you go through seasons. You don't feel well. You just don't feel like yourself. And there's a lot on your mind and you, you're hurt. And it's like, listen, I, I don't feel 50 today. But I think that's what relationships are, give right. and take. You yes. can't just take, 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 and you can't just give, give, give. Yes. What do you think, Flo, 50-50? I mean, I don't think that I can do any better than what she just said. You, you give your best. Right. And if my best today um, is 30% and he's going to come with the 70 to make that 100, then that's great. I, so I am. I like that. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Core. Uh, okay, 50 /50. but I also think that you cannot go, like if you're uh, talking to like a newlywed or an engaged couple, you cannot go into marriage thinking like, I, okay, we're each going to give 50. It's a 50-50 thing. Like you have to go into marriage thinking, I'm giving fully of myself. That's right. right. I am giving 100% of myself. And that's not gonna look like 100% every day, but you have to be willing to fully give in because the way averages work, let's talk about math, mm -hmm. is that 100 plus 100 divided by two is 100, okay? It's not 100 plus 100 is 200, okay? <laughs> that's how math works. Yeah. So you have to go in fully giving yourself. And when two people fully give of themselves, they fully receive. Of themselves. You know, Colossians 3 says, whatever we do, we do unto the Lord. So if the spouse is not giving the 100%, we are still required to be accountable to God. We are co-equal heirs. In Christ, we receive an inheritance from Him. But also, He gives us responsibilities here that we work unto Him and we glorify Him in whatever we do. Well, while I have you, this is a really good question. I'm going to go to you on I this one. I do like this question. Somebody wrote to us. Thank you. It says, I'm engaged. Congrats. My husband assumed I would take his last name once married. I planned on keeping my maiden name. Now he's hurt. Do I have to take my husband's name? Well, I can understand that he would assume it because that's traditional. But I'm going to give him one word. Pride. What? Yes, oh, pride. No. What? Yes, why? What does it matter to him if she has his last name? Is your last name so important that he has that she has to have it? Now with me, when I was working, my boss said, "You've been single, you're your community knows you can you hold on to your maiden name I said oh yeah my my parents paid for college and school and I think they would be proud of that so there are other reasons it wasn't just I don't like your name or I don't want your name some men take on the female's name so you know let's not get tied up so much in the culture and tradition that we can't sometimes go with our wife on what she likes. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh my. Wow. Corey, okay, Corey. There, there actually is a solid logical reason why oh. the men's surname was taken on. And that is because the maternal, you know, parentage was not questioned because the mom has the baby. And so the paternal parentage was known because their surname was okay. taken on. And so that's how that tradition was passed along. And so that's how we move along with the tradition of the father's surname being passed along. So, I mean, it definitely should Out be- with the old and with the new. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I 
I mean, it, I think it needs to be a discussion, though. We are in a new culture, and I do think it should be something you agree on before you get married because it can be a very heated discussion, and I do think it's something you should agree on before you get married. Oh, my. Did they not discuss it prior to? And what's wrong with hyphenating? Because some people are established in business, and right. your name is already out there. Preach it so. Because what <laughs> happens when two hyphenated people marry two hyphenated people? Oh, yeah. And then they want to hyphenate. We got 17 last yeah, night. Right. That's what some well, cultures think you can discuss. Help it. me, yeah. Amy. I didn't even consider this when I was thinking about this question, but if you just think about the lineage of Christ, and he is from the lion of the tribe oh, of Judah. She's there is Bible a tribe, <laughs> there is a lineage, there's a genealogy, and it is this man was this son, was this, this and this was this. What if, you know, what if they said, you know, we're gonna go with uh Shiro right there, and it ends up just screwing everything up. Yeah, to me, it's a great some... honor to be Mrs. Schaefer. We, well, we are pioneering honor. our whole family. It's a beautiful thing. So I don't understand this. I don't want to take his last right. name. And I have to say, when Roxanne <laughs> said it's pride, and I agree that it's pride, but it's my pride that I take Kathy Seviller as my name for the last many, 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 many years. And I'm a McNamara for sure, oh, especially are. March 17th, <laughs> St. Patrick's Day, green. But I'm so thrilled and proud to take my husband's name. So I do not understand hyphens or this lady that wrote this. <laughs> That's okay. Ooh, okay. Do we see that on criticism? Or was that a critique? It was. Um, I have to wrap up this section right now. We'll see you in just a minute. <laughs> I almost started singing my Irish name McNamara song for these girls here. I'm getting a lot of trouble because I like to be the husband's name. So anyway, that was a great that was a great question. We do thank you for that. But that these are good, good too. These are really good. They're all good. So we hope that you're enjoying this from your living room and as Amy has always said, write to us. Let us know what your opinion is. And this question says, how do you handle differences? of opinions. On our panel, we just let it go. But can there be <laughs> resolutions flow when you have differences of opinion, whether husband, wife, friends, I think coworkers? there's always resolution. We right. all bear in us the Ministry of Reconciliation. And Ooh, the thing of it is, is that I think the biggest problem is what we think the resolution should look like. Even that question that we just had about last names, we all have a mindset of whether tradition or non-traditional or whatever, this, this is okay, take the name on. This isn't okay, take the name off. Um, when you have, I believe the Holy Ghost is great at teaching us conflict resolution skills. And what I mean by that is the word of God tells us what? to come and let's reason together. Mm -hmm. A soft answer turneth away that's, wrath. That's right. Amen. But there has been times that I think all of us have experienced doing the very best we can to bring a resolve, to bring peace for as much lies within you, you know, and however the end of it is not exactly what we were hoping for. That's Sometimes good. the resolution is I gotta walk away. Well, that didn't resolve it, but that's okay. <laughs> that's kind of what I would do. It does <laughs> resolve it because you're no longer, you're not going to, I don't allow you to be yeah. toxic in my life. Yes. So sometimes right. you're trying to make something work with someone and it's just not yeah. going to. So know when to hold them. Okay, what do you got? I, yeah. Well, we live in a society and a culture that cannot handle disagreement. I mean, mm -hmm. it is True. a truly <laughs> offended culture we live in. Mm -hmm. And True. I just think that we need to realize disagreement does not mean disrespect. That's right. Amen. When you disagree with someone, now you can be disrespectful in your disagreement, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. But you can very respectfully disagree. I, we do that right here on the panel. Mm -hmm. You can disagree with someone and it, that is not disrespect. And I think that we as a society mm -hmm. need to learn That's that. Good. We need to learn that we can disagree with each other and still love each other, right. still be neighbors, still 
learn to right. live with each other. Right. That's a different question about love. But what do you have on this yeah, resolution? Um, she's right, I believe. Proverbs 26 says, don't disagree with a fool according to his folly. Don't answer somebody the way they're talking to you. If they're attacking you personally, if they're talking about your brother, your sister, your whoever, because you can't discuss the issue <laughs> because you don't agree on the issue, don't answer them according to their folly. Flo says walk away until you're ready to argue the issue. Yes. Okay, I'll be back <laughs> and argue the issue, but don't attack personally everything else around me. I like that. Because you disagree with my idea or opinion. I like that. I and would say, too, just one caution. Don't let the differences become divisions. Yes. Paul said, watch that's out good. for that's those good. who call divisions right. among you. Yeah, that's Amen. good. And this next question is similar because Corey mentioned love. So I'm going to come to you with this love question. And it goes like this. This is so good. This is so me. Do you believe that love can overcome anything? I do. I don't. <laughs> What do you got? Uh, you know, the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. Da -da 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 -da. I love the Beatles. I mean, I love the Beatles too, but it's just the world does not run on sunshine and rainbows. And I just think sometimes mm. love isn't enough. Sometimes love means walking away. Sometimes love means saying goodbye. Y love just isn't the only thing that runs the world. I wish it was. I I mean, I wish it was too, but it's just, I, I just think sometimes people think we have love and that's all we need. Um, okay, that's well, you, you also have responsibilities that you have to <laughs> fulfill. You can't just sit around and live on your love, okay? I'm going to ask Flo <laughs> to sing it. Amy, come on, give me some love stuff. So the question, do you believe that love can overcome anything? So apart from my opinions or thought, like just the flat out scripture says that love never fails. Love never fails. So even if that love is me, you know, backing away or getting a new job or that, that's lo love can never fail. I like that. And I think if we, if we just try to the best of our ability to put that at the forefront of everything. It says it never fades out, it never becomes obsolete, and it never comes to an end. So, I mean, there, the problem is how are people defining love? Love yes. is love is love. I mean, there are so many weird, kooky definitions of love. Okay, but according right. to 1 Corinthians 13, that kind of love, that God kind of love, that will never fail. I need your wisdom on this love question. I, you know, I think everybody here is sharing some wisdom, but I, my perspective on it is, I'm playing off of what you just said, the definition of love. And I think we, people tend to have a mindset of what love looks like. Mm -hmm. And you forget mm -hmm. about love for yourself. Okay. And um, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. believe that the love for myself will cause me to conquer all things. And so let me explain that. Okay, I love you, but we have a disagreement or something goes awry. And sometimes to my own detriment, I can get so involved trying to prove and trying to show you that I love you, but something's broken inside of you and you can't receive it. Mm -hmm. So the love that I have for the Lord, which causes me to love myself, cause in me dwells him, right? right, right Christ right. in me, the hope of glory, makes me know there's a time and a season for everything. And in this time, in this particular season, I may need to just leave that alone until you have that encounter with God that brings change. Okay. I think that we see it as we are the change agent. Love is the change agent. But what is it doing to work in at that time? Sometimes it's you as the right. individual. Right. What do you have a scripture for me on this love well, question? Well, God is love, 1 John. That's right. What love, they're saying, oh, what love? It's God's love. It's sacrificial love. It's giving love. It's being the servant, not the leader. It's being, what they say, the tail, not the head, going last instead of first. When we have that kind of, what do they call that? Agape love, yes. sacrificial, yes. communal, covenant love then God is love. That's true. Now this last question is really, really good. And you write us kind of hard things, <laughs> to be honest, because this is hard. Mm -hmm. And Amy, I'm gonna ask you, 
it says, you wrote, why does God make it so hard to follow him? So she thinks it's hard. I don't think it's hard. Right. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. It's easy, oh, take my God. burden on you. It's light. Mm -hmm. And in Matthew 11, 28 through 30 in the Message Bible, you learn that um, there is an unforced rhythm of grace. And when you do it God's way, he's the designer. So to me, God designs a Porsche. You don't take a Porsche off road. You do it according mm. to the way the designer operates. We are designed by God, for him, by him, create. So it's easy. Yeah, but she doesn't think Christ. so. So, so this answer. Somebody answer this to the people. I think it has to do sometimes with our maturity level. Spiritual for things her. are spiritually discerned. Sometimes for all of us. I even even myself. A lot of the things that I have learned by the grace of God have been through parabolic type benefits. What? And so. In the, in the scriptures, Jesus did a oh, lot parable. of teaching with parables, okay. yes. correct? Yes. And there were some things that what I had to learn, because I, I used to get frustrated and, you know, I would say to God, why, why don't you just, just say it straight? You know, why do I have to <laughs> right. figure it out? Why do I have to? But what I That's found really is when I did my due diligence with it, studying to show myself approved. Look how all of us have grown over in 10 years, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know? So some of those things that I have had to search out, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. And when that happens, then that revelation gets firebrand in my spirit. Right. And that makes all the difference. Right. What do you yeah, have? I mean, to go along with that, you know, I think it becomes harder to follow God when we doubt God. When, yes, when our faith wavers, it does become harder. Um, but a scripture to go with that is Matthew 17, 20. Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So if, you know, if you're struggling with, with following God, you know, uh, turn to the scriptures. There's so much encouragement there. You know, I, I love this scripture because when you, when, you know, we yeah. feel doubt too. Which, say the scripture it's again. It's Matthew 17, 20. I, I mean, I feel doubt when I see this, when I, you know, have faith as small as a mustard seed and oh. I can move mountain, that nothing will be impossible for you. You know, the Lord is there with you. He is there. Yeah. That is encouraging to right. me. Roxanne, she's asking that she feels God makes it hard to follow. Yeah, Hello. You know, <clears throat> she's blaming God for the hard road. There you go. You know, God doesn't make the road hard. He makes it challenging. That's good. And, and so there are times when we think it's hard, but when we get on the other side, what's he say? The way is narrow. The path is is close. You've got, you have to follow a close path. But the Pharisees, Jesus condemned them because they put loads on people. What was Amy saying, take my yoke. They put loads on people so strong. They say, but you, Jesus says, you die, you tithe with deal and cumin, but you forget the weightier things of the law. Truth, mercy, justice. Amen. She has to keep her eyes on the Lord. The road might be hard. Some are called to a difficult challenge. Maybe you're not a Mother Teresa, but you're gonna have to give yourself for your neighbor, for your child, for somebody else. That's not hard, that's a calling. Right, right. And I think yeah. what makes it hard too is sometimes our flesh, right? We die daily. And yes. when my flesh is alive and screaming one thing, yes. and it's completely the opposite yeah. of what God is right. saying. That's but I love good. what Amy said. She said, Jesus simply says, take my yoke. Yes. It's easy. So for someone to feel that it's hard yeah. to follow God makes me really sad yeah. because it's not hard. He takes your stuff and puts it on his shoulder and That's shows good. you the way to live. We'll be right back right after this. We close with Psalm chapter 119, verses 116 and 117. Uphold me according to your word, that I may live and not let me be ashamed of my hope. Hold me up and I shall be safe and I shall observe your statutes continually. Expectations, disagreements, disappointments must at times be may we release those to God 
in order that he may uphold us. When my father was ill in the hospital and received the report that he would not survive, my mom graciously said, I do not receive that report, but I do release him to Jesus. Ephesians 6 states to us that we must only hold on to one thing, hope. Hope in God's promise. Hope is the anchor of our souls, firm and secure. First Peter reveals to us that we are spiritually born into a living hope because Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus is our living hope. Jesus is God's promise. Let's release ourselves to Jesus in order that he may uphold us. The Lord says in Isaiah 41, I will uphold you with my victorious, righteous right hand. That's my girl, Roxy. We say to her, do you have a scripture? She <laughs> always has a scripture. And the story about her father brought all of our hearts to glory. Really, we thank you. And on Sister to Sister, we love each other so much. So when one sister tells a story of struggle, the other sister has tears down her face. Yes. We love all of you so much for being with us on Sister to Sister. And we'll be back again next week.